welcome or a good morning from uh, North Central Ohio in the United States. Um, I need to thank Cindy and uh, a number of others uh, who I haven't had the privilege of meeting yet uh, for setting this all up. Um, and so basically I, I want to do a short disclaimer and say that I'm not a professional software developer. Uh, I'm not a professional speaker. Uh, my charts are very uh, ad hoc. And, um, but uh, we are deeply invested in the use of MediaWiki uh, at my little part of the space agency. I wanted to tell you um, or tell a story of how we came to be invested with MediaWiki and, uh, and where we hope that uh, that partnership goes. Uh, so the talk is called uh, a, a, an open CSP community. Um, so this is like, I'm not speaking on behalf of the agency, I'm speaking on behalf of my department, uh, my group uh, in North Central Ohio at the Armstrong Test Facility. So a couple of opening remarks just to help everyone get oriented. Um, There we go. Uh, a lot of people, most people are familiar with uh, the, the existence of NASA, but it's not always clear where NASA is physically located uh, in the world. And specifically, there's about 17 uh, areas in the United States that NASA operates. Some of the more famous ones are the Launch Center down at Kennedy uh, in Florida. Uh, Mission Control is in Houston, Texas, the Johnson Space Center. And there's a number of other places um, where the agency has a footprint. And uh, each, each center, each field center has specific capabilities. Um, we're located here in North Central Ohio. Um, the Glenn Research Center is our parent organization uh, and in Cleveland, Ohio, and then 50 miles west is the Armstrong Test Facility uh, in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, the, uh, to zoom in a little bit more, uh, the Armstrong Test Facility is roughly a 26 uh, square kilometer um, uh, enclosed area. It's out among the, the corn and the cows in rural Ohio. Uh, it's a it's so it's away from big cities. Uh, you can see Lake Erie in the background. You can see the city of Sandusky um, to the north. And uh, but otherwise, you'll see that this uh, mostly wooded area has is dotted with some some buildings. And these buildings represent some of the world's largest uh, space environment test chambers. Uh, the original campus was um, was set up back in the 60s. Uh, it used to belong to the Army during World War II. It was handed over to the newly formed Space Agency, and it was originally designed to do uh, a lot of upper stage um, engine testing and platform testing. So, uh, not so much, not so much the uh, the heavy lift rockets um, for uh, for getting into low Earth orbit, but mostly the payloads. And so um, the chart that I have now, you can see, well, to our customers, um, Armstrong Test Facility is a large spaceflight testing facility in rural Ohio near Lake Erie, uh, home to several of the world's largest and most powerful space environment test chambers. We, we recreate the vacuum of space in our chambers. Uh, we bombard spacecraft with uh, the extreme acoustic levels that they experience during launch and re-entry. We have uh, the world's most powerful uh, shaker table, so we can put spacecraft uh, on, on the table and shake them in ways that would be representative of what they would experience during launch and re-entry. And of course, we can recreate the electromagnetic environment um, and everything that the spacecraft is going to experience uh, in the service environment, i.e. space. Um, you can see some of our prominent customers uh, on the left. We recently did the Artemis uh, Exploration Mission 1 uh, Orion crew module, and you can see that featured here. Uh, the crew module is where the astronauts, um, is where the astronauts uh, live, and uh, the service module below is, is all of the um, supporting systems that they need on their, on their uh, lunar and cislunar missions. 
Um, here you can see the vibration table, and then this is the service module from the from the Artemis EM1. Uh, we did a, an extensive um, vibration testing and acoustic testing. We've also worked with SpaceX, uh, their Falcon 9 uh, payload fairing and, uh, and Dragon capsules have been through our facilities. And so this is the type of work that we do. Um, for the purposes though of this talk, uh, Armstrong Test Facility is about 120 technical and non-technical knowledge workers. Um, they don't recognize themselves as knowledge workers, but uh, because of what my role, uh, that's I see all of my colleagues as knowledge workers. Uh, they're tasked with operating and maintaining um, approximately six uh, of these big test facilities. Um, we are a part of the federal government. We are trying to do more with less. Uh, budgets are always increasingly tight. Uh, we're trying to comply with uh, federal directives to move away from paper records and do more, uh, more of our everyday work digitally. Uh, we're trying to modernize our methods uh, and comply with uh, Office of uh, Management and Budget mandates uh, to seek uh, open source solutions uh, within the government. And, uh, and to that end, uh, I've been running a semantic media wiki server for all of our knowledge management needs since roughly 2008. And uh, that's really the story that I'd like to tell you. Um, and in fact, if you guys don't mind, we'll, uh, we'll get into the Wayback Machine. And uh, before I worked at NASA, um, I, I began my career in 1995 uh, as, an, as an electrical engineer. And my background uh, is digital systems, analog circuits, embedded systems. Uh, as a programmer, I have done an awful lot of uh, firmware development for embedded systems. Um, but my, my training and my trade is not really involved, doesn't really involve uh, business applications or web related um, uh, application development. So I come into this um, in the mid 90s as an electrical engineer working at a national laboratory in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, it's the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. It's still there doing wonderful work today. Um, this is what that campus looks like um, from the air. It's roughly a, almost a mile uh, of an accelerator ring. And then there's different uh, beamline targets. And um, for my part, I was involved in a, um, in a smaller program that was developing free electron laser technology, which I'm showing in the bottom right, um, as part of uh, a collaboration between the Department of Energy and the Office of Naval Research. Um, these were my colleagues in the control room operating the free electron laser. And uh, this is a throwback Thursday picture of me in 1995 with uh, long hair working on some of the electronics uh, that support these accelerator systems. And so as an accelerator um, beamline diagnostics engineer, instrumentation engineer, there's a lot of devices that uh, you can't buy off the shelf. And so uh, the control system and the data system for operating a large particle accelerator involves lots of in-house custom electronics. And that means lots of in-house custom uh, code uh, for these devices. And while we had a, a really great program in place for managing uh, CAD drawings and circuit boards and schematics were captured very well, there in, in that period in, of time in the mid 90s, uh, the, the emergence of firmware development was largely happening on the laptops or the computers of, of the developers. And we didn't really have a good, uh, a good repository system for capturing um, firmware. And so that was really the, 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 the task that I set out to fix. And so um, around 1997, I took it upon myself um, uh, outside of my normal job duties uh, to start playing with, uh, with this, this new uh, web uh, capability that tools that were available to me. And at the time it was um, Microsoft IIS server, which was ASP based. And, uh, and starting around 1997 and all the way um, for, for 
almost a, a decade afterwards, I began to hand code um, a firmware management system from scratch. Um, and I called it DevLore. And you can see a screenshot of it from uh, on the right. There's a, a white paper that I published towards around 2005 uh, to, to describe this in better detail. But um, that's really what I was doing at the time was in it, you know, as I was performing my, my duties as, a, as an instrumentation uh, and controls engineer for the accelerator systems, I was developing this, uh, this, this firmware repository as a hand-coded uh, website. Just another quick screenshot to show you the kinds of things that it did. In hindsight, um, I would describe this as a, as a web-based database application. So there was a SQL database on the back end. Um, and there were, you know, ODBC drivers that, that were written into the, into the HTML that could go and get the data from, uh, from, the, from the database on the back end. And this, that's how this whole thing worked. You, you know, you, it was, um, it was a, a great way to really quickly drill in uh, to target the, the, the areas of the machine that we cared about and, and upload and update uh, the, the library of firmware. Um, unfortunately, right around, uh, well, the, the laser project that we were working on uh, completed around the 2007 timeframe. And with the completion of that project, uh, it was also no longer, we did no longer had the need to have this server. So the project shut down. And this was my first big life lesson in lifecycle planning was, uh, you know, spent all this time developing all this code um, to, to manage a, or to, you know, to provide um, a system. And there's really no life cycle planning. And, uh, and so I told myself, well, you know, over the decade that had happened, um, I had discovered MediaWiki around 2005. And I knew that if I was going to ever do this again, um, I wasn't ever going to try to develop a website, a web application from scratch. Uh, I was going to leverage open source projects and specifically MediaWiki. So that's my introduction to the MediaWiki world. Um, however, in 2007, that represents a major change for me. Um, I left the national labs uh, and I took a new position in the space agency. And I was excited to be part of, um, of the re return to uh, human exploration. Uh, at the time, it was the Constellation program. Uh, but we were going to start doing the testing of the Orion spacecraft as early as uh, 2007 was, was when this was being talked about. And if you guys follow Space News, you'll know that um, just at the end of last year, um, the Exploration Mission 1, this spacecraft that, that I'm showing uh, in one of our facilities, this picture was taken roughly around 2020. And, uh, and then that spacecraft was shipped down to Florida where it was integrated with the full uh, launch system. And this is the spacecraft that recently came back from the moon. Um, so it was a transition uh, from, from the Department of Energy National Labs to the Space Agency um, uh, Space Environment Test Facilities. And, uh, and I was now working as a data acquisition engineer for extreme space environment testing. and we had the same problem. We needed a place to document the technical details of all of our complex systems. Um, so now I'm sort of approaching this from the perspective of what software do I need? And uh, some of the, this chart is meant, uh, I just went out and got a, a generic constellation diagram, um, uh, did white out on, on whatever was there previously and just started throwing uh, software uh, classification type acronyms on it. So it's meant to say that there really isn't a, uh, a, a, a structure of how different software types exist, that they're just kind of all out there as a constellation to pick from. And so, you know, you have some decision maker shown in the bottom left, and their job is to decide what kind of software they need. And on the right hand side, I've tried to show a bulleted list of what these acronyms mean. Uh, you may recognize many of them. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, I settled on MediaWiki because I knew that that had the, um, the capability to have custom extensions. 
and I was already familiar with 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 using it for other things. Um, MediaWiki is a core MediaWiki, and I, I, I forgive me for for you know saying this to this audience. Uh, as as we all know, um, core MediaWiki is great wiki software, um, and a lot of people also use it as a content management system. Uh, but I don't think it is thought of when you start thinking about all these other different things that people need software for. Um, so step one is to really understand what it is that you want a particular application for before you make a selection. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about what knowledge management means to me. Um, simplifying to the extreme, I would say that knowledge management is essentially uh, the integration of people, processes, and technology coming together um, in, it gives you the, the foundation of knowledge management, these three concepts. Uh, a, a phrase that I like uh, to use is, is that knowledge management is the process of getting the right data to the right people at the right time. Um, and when knowledge management is done right, it cuts across multiple software systems. Um, an example of what I'm referring to is that if, if people processes and technology is the foundation of knowledge management, Within an organization, all of our uh, internal processes for how we do work is, is uh, established through a collection of procedures um, which give us the high-level policies of you know, who needs to do a certain activity, when they need to do it, and why they're doing it. Um, but then the technical details of which data silo they may need to go to and what the exact format of the data product is those kinds of uh, details are typically kept in what's called work instructions. So the combination of uh, procedures and policy with work instructions on how and where results in what you can see is this actor swim lane based uh, flowchart for getting things done uh, within the government, right? We, we love our forms and so most work is all handled by forms being exchanged and in the process of people doing different tasks, uh, you get lots of documents produced as the output. Um, now, in in an older paradigm, um, and I would say this is this is definitely how it was uh, as I experienced it uh, at the beginning of my career at NASA. Uh, that these the people, the processes, and the technologies are are pretty well separated. Um, the processes are documented in some kind of an organizational policy library. Um, the the people are uh, it is it is their it is their existence as uh, the the intelligence the knowledge that they have that they're making use of in in following the processes um, involves uh, the, the it's not integrated into the technology. So what I'm trying to show here is that if your process people processes and technology are not integrated in a single environment, then you get these kind of uh, walls that separate the different elements. And what that results in is, is that knowledge management is, uh, it, it emerges as a fourth activity. So, you, you know, you, you have to do the knowledge management uh, painfully and as, as a separate activity in addition to the actual work that you're doing. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is that if we have the right platform and if we have the right software tooling, then we can um, we can integrate the people into the platform, the processes into the platform, and the different data silos and technology into the platform, such that um, the workflows can be all digital from beginning to end. And instead of having a bunch of knowledge management um, record keeping, to be performed at the end of a task, all of the records are digital to begin with, uh, and they're automatically where they need to be as they're being used. And so uh, with this approach, if we can achieve it, um, as we come back here to um, why do you know why semantic media wiki and uh, and why media wiki. Um, this decision about what software to use is informed by uh, by the following. So I've listed what I call four fun facts on the left. And uh, the first fun fact is, is that with MediaWiki uh, and, and certain extensions, 
you can store data in the pages as as page content uh, with semantic annotations. Fun fact number two is that you can query that data um, from other pages. And so you can have pages that store data and other pages that, um, that return page uh, query results. So that turns into fun fact number three, which, which means that you can implement, uh, you can use MediaWiki as the foundation for a database application um, that might be organizationally specific. So your whatever it was that you in the past may have reached out to uh, the IT department and asked for some specific database to be set up, uh, you can it, you can accomplish all of that within MediaWiki. Uh, and that results in the discovery number four that I came up with that I realized was um, was that uh, once you realize you can do uh, database applications on MediaWiki, then you can begin to implement complete organizational processes, start to finish with, uh, with other extensions like page forms and flex forms. Uh, and uh, you, know, you, you can really take these, um, these uh, business processes and replicate them uh, in the MediaWiki environment. So uh, what I hope has, has come through in this is that this constellation where, where MediaWiki is recognized as wiki software and sometimes recognized as content management software, um, because of these four facts, uh, it allows MediaWiki to be the foundation of uh, it, it to, to transcend its classification as wiki software and it can be used to emulate many of the core features of, of lots of the other software categories. So on the right-hand side, what I'm trying to show is, is that when you extend MediaWiki with additional extensions and, and you build um, tooling content, uh, form pages, property pages, category pages, and that these, these um, the site special site content is, is uh, specifically developed to implement organizational processes, uh, then you're well on the way to having, uh, using MediaWiki as a platform for business processes. Um, so what I'm showing then is, is that one of the added benefits of using semantic MediaWiki is that uh, not only does it give us this integrated uh, knowledge management platform that we can implement our uh, ISO business processes as wiki-based tooling, but we can use form-based input and we get semantic data output. And that gives us um, a knowledge graph in the back end uh, that we, let's see here. So, and knowledge graphs um, allow us to, to gain other insights from the data that may not be directly sought after uh, on the, you know, like if you take all of your organizational processes and if all of the information that all of the artifacts that come out of those processes is all part of the of a triple store, then you have an organizational knowledge graph and you can, you can analyze it to gain uh, insights about your organization that may not be directly evident from the processes themselves. Um, so here is a list on the left that uh, I just tried to put down uh, the different internal processes that we have implemented wiki-based tooling for. Uh, I've highlighted some of the ones that are that have become sort of a, a cornerstone of our of our workflows. Uh, we're using MediaWiki um, to do risk management for our, for our organization. We're using it to track uh, internal travel plans so that we can uh, collect and project what our travel budgets need to be, uh, actions and issue tracking, uh, cyber, cyber security compliance, and, and all kinds of other regulation compliances. Um, so we built a really um, extensible compliance tracking tool. Uh, and we use it for tracking equipment inventory, software inventory, and systems management, just to name a few. And the list is constantly growing. Um, last year, um, and maybe a little bit even uh, a year before that, we began working, uh, seeking a solution for what we call facility work instructions. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this, but the basic idea is that uh, we have our technicians in the field that currently are printing off a procedure and putting it on a clipboard. And as they do the steps for quality and reliability traceability, where we require them to initial and sign uh, the date or and give the date and initial when each step was performed as part of our overall quality program. Um, and what we're looking to do with our facility work instructions tooling is to um, take the clipboards and paper away, give them tablets that they can take into the field and that they can perform these work instructions with uh, traceability, step-by-step -step traceability, who performed the step and when it was performed, that we could capture all of that as data um, in the system. So that's that's one of the that, that's where I got um, involved with open CSP. Um, so I mentioned the knowledge graph a little bit. Um, I can't help but show this one as well. One of the things that uh, the agency is interested in right now is natural language processing. And, and like I said, because the um, because we use semantic media wiki, the data that we store in our pages and all of the artifacts that are produced through our um, business processes creates this um, knowledge graph in the back end and that enables us to start doing more uh, natural language processing initiatives uh, that would be the they would be the focus of an entirely different talk. Um, I did give a talk on that um, at uh, Semantic Media Wiki Con, SMW Con, Fall 2021, um, if you're interested in hearing more about that. So this is um, my attempt to create our technology stack. Uh, the, at the very bottom of the stack is the, is the bare metal. Uh, we, get a, we get a server from our data center. It's a virtual machine. They can spin up a VM for us that complies with all of the agency's uh, cybersecurity controls implemented, pre-implemented. So we get a very secure agency-defined um, bare server. And then on that server, we begin to uh, install all of the usual pieces. Uh, we've been using Red Hat, uh, Red Hat 7. Uh, Apache is our web server. PHP is the scripting engine. MySQL is the database backend. We're working our way up the stack. We use Elasticsearch as our search engine for triple stores. Uh, authentication is and authorization are done using agency uh, services. So uh, not surprising, the agency operates its own internal single sign-on service, and that's how we know who our users are. And the agency also has an integrated um, uh, uh, roles management system uh, where the agency can track all of the user permissions uh, in a centralized system. And then we include those permissions with a, in a SAML attribute. Uh, so when users visit our site, we, we know who they are and we know what they're authorized to do. So we're not doing any user identification uh, locally and we're not doing any uh, authorization locally. The admins are put into the admin group uh, contributors are put into the contributor groups automatically through an external system. Um, the centerpiece of the tech stack is, of course, MediaWiki. Uh, and on top of MediaWiki, we have many extensions. And, uh, and the tech stack doesn't stop there because um, at, at this point in the tech stack, you would just let this, this is where we just have a, um, a wiki that people can use in a, in, a, in a way that's very similar to Wikipedia or what the user experience is of Wikipedia. Um, but we go beyond that and we start developing our property pages uh, for the semantics. We start developing categories for the different types of uh, artifacts that our processes require. Uh, template pages to standardize the way that uh, pages look to the user and forms to standardize the way that we get data from the users. So our users are not editing articles uh, as much as they are filling out forms and hitting save. Um, we're not we're not really creating uh, a collection of encyclopedia entries. We're creating a collection of form data. Each page uh, is defined by a form and presents as a through templates as a form, and uh, and we're basically collecting that structured data um, as semantic data through the use of forms. And uh, and again, you can see at the top. 
um, what I'm calling wiki tools. And when you have these forms, templates, categories, and properties that have been specifically crafted to, uh, to implement something like risk management tools or document management tools, um, those pages work together as a bundle, and then the, those, that collection of pages is managed as a little mini project, a little mini software project. Um, so the tech stack, I would say, breaks into um, three pieces. You've got the server at the bottom, the bare metal. You've got the application stack, which uh, we have been using an Ansible project called Meza. Uh, that was developed by the Flight Operations Directorate at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, and then we got on board around, uh, I think it was 2012, we, we switched over to using Meza. Um, Meza is just automation. Uh, so the Meza project uh, with a few simple commands allows us to uh, update and, uh, and, and administrate, do all the administrative aspects of of the uh, application stack, all the all the components. We, we don't have to manage these components individually. We just let Meza do the management for us. So that means that we the the amount of time that's required um, to to administrate the server is extremely low. Uh, however, the time that it takes to develop and maintain what I'm calling the special content at the top of the pyramid this becomes the content, the, the page content that we're creating to implement all of our tools. And uh, my concern at this point is, is that the top of this tech stack is now something that doesn't exist on GitHub. It's not out there for people to contribute to. And, and my concern is, is that, that the top of the stack is becoming DevLore2. Um, so we've got you know uh, 20 plus uh, organizational processes that we've developed in tooling for, and uh, and all of those pages. It's content that's kept in the MediaWiki database. It is technically um, it's technically user content, but it's uh, it's what I'm calling tooling content. Um, and so the, the 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 heart of what we're here to talk about today is. Um, if I'm developing special templates and forms and properties for my work purposes, I imagine that there's lots of people out there that are also doing it. And so we have all these um, islands of individual user content, and there isn't a way to share um, to share that content. And so that's what this is really about, is trying to develop that part of the community, which doesn't exist right now. So right now, only NASA GRC ATF is working on the wiki-based business tools that we use. Um, there's hundreds of hours and thousands of pages, and we'd like to find, we'd like to open source this, and we'd like to um, have it be part of a community project. And um, so I'll just take a real quick detour and take a look at one of the NASA uh, handbooks, tech handbooks. Um, you can find this if you do a, you know, your own web search, you can find the handbook. It is publicly available. It's the Applications Program Handbook. Um, it's quite lengthy. It talks a lot about ap application rationalization for the agency. But what I want to draw your attention to is some key sections. And I've, I've uh, underlined in red and, and drawn, you know, put some red arrows here to draw your attention to it, um, is that what the Application Handbook is directing us to do is to seek software built with a modern web architecture. So no more of this hand-coded stuff that's, that's uh, custom. Uh, they want us to seek vendor independence through the use of open source software. So that's a, that's a, so not only do we want to try to open source the software that we develop, but where possible, we want uh, to use out-of-the-box tooling from existing open source. And I think that's, um, yeah, so to prefer, um, open source uh, and commercial off-the-shelf solutions over custom-built solutions. And, uh, and lastly is stick to standard tooling. So anytime the agency uses a piece of software and then they ask for some, uh, some customization that is a, a deviation from, from the out-of-the-box software, 
then it becomes the responsibility of, of the space agency to maintain that customization. So that's considered a risk. And um, as much as possible, uh, they want us to use out of the box application workflows. Now that said, um, there aren't any. So as what we're trying to do is, is comply with what the agency's application program handbook says, uh, we wanna seek software built with a modern web architecture. We want to seek vendor independence through open source. We wanna avoid custom solutions and stick to standard tooling. So when we go back to the tech stack um, and we say, what is the future of all of this tooling content uh, that the users are not editing, but is, is there facilitating the business processes, uh, wouldn't it be nice if there was a nonprofit open source community project that was interested in providing an online repository for pre-developed tool page bundles. I apologize, this is a mouthful. Um, that that we can continue to contribute and uh, contribute our work to, and um, and something like an open CSP project. Um, so open CSP project, uh, as I've been talking with the folks that are um, developing it, uh, they they have affirmed that these are all the the values and the strategic goals of the project. And um, so now we go back to our decision maker. Uh, and their responsibility is to try to figure out what software they're going to use for their organization. And seldom, um, seldom does the decision maker uh, search for wiki solutions for business processes. And so that's sort of the, the challenge is how do we get, um, how do we get the decision makers to realize that while MediaWiki is advertised as wiki software um, with just a little bit more work uh, to add extensions and special content, you can, you can achieve most of the functionality of many of the other software types that you need for your organization. And that would allow us to uh, achieve this kind of cross-cutting um, integrated knowledge management model where we can get the right people uh, get the right data to the right people at the right time um, by keeping everything managed within one place. So in conclusion, um, I've got a couple of main takeaways. Number one, out of the box media wiki is appropriately classified as wiki software, no, no surprise there. Um, number two, extensions and tooling pages allow media wiki to be more than just wiki software. Organizations seeking software solutions for anything other than a wiki will likely not consider MediaWiki. And lastly, um, organizations that use MediaWiki as more than just a wiki will need to manage their tooling page content as software. So that means that the, the uh, forms, templates, categories, and properties need to have a software project plan developed around them, um, unless we can get that from the community. So that's my last. Uh, my, my last bullet here is that, um, to my eye, the MediaWiki community needs a place where users can define and develop and distribute bundles of content pages, which, when added to a given wiki, will provide various enterprise-ready business process tools. And we would like to seed that project with as many of the tools as we've created so far. Uh, and then lastly, the, the goal here is, this is one of the things I love most about working for the space agency, is that right in our charter, um, that when the space agency was created um, by Congress so many decades ago, um, it is what we do is for the benefit of all. And I believe this to be part of that. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll turn it back to Cindy and uh, we can do questions. So at this point now, we will open this up to questions. And I do see there are already a couple thank yous, um, which Rich has just seen as well in chat on Google. All right, so I, I comment on YouTube. Don't have any questions, but this was very interesting to listen to. I did not expect to be this much drawn into the talk, but I was positively surprised. Thank you. Thank you. So we're getting a lot of thank yous, not so many questions. I think people are processing what they heard, but a lot of people appreciate it. Uh, so 
Um, your own asks on YouTube. Hi, Rich. Have you tried using OpenCSP yet? Um, we have used OpenCSP on a development system. We have not used it in our production system yet. Um, one of the challenges we're faced with is, <clears throat> as it is right now, as OpenCSP is still very early, um, we don't feel that it is everything that it needs to be to, it would be great for a new system, but um, how to integrate it to a system, that, to a server that's been around for over a decade um, is not straightforward. So we're, we're setting up test servers and trying to get our work instruction tooling um, developed on, the, on a dedicated development machine that uses OpenCSP. Um, and then once we have that, we'll start figuring out how to, how to migrate it into the production system. Great question. Another question from YouTube. Um, Richard, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Can you share with us a quick view on using OpenCMP CSP in relation to AI and ML? Um, well, so um, to we haven't connected OpenCSP to anything like um, machine learning um, or artificial intelligence yet. So um, I, I hope I'm hearing the question properly, but the AI and machine learning aspect is strictly on the triple store that's produced by Semantic Media Wiki. Um, and that's also a side project um, where uh, outside of the tech stack that I showed, there are other techs that we're adding to the server on the side um, to, to assist with that. All right. So we have a question here um, on Meet. Was there any resistance within NASA to using MediaWiki in this way? What was the resistance and how was it overcome? Um, yes, there, there, is there has been resistance. There continues to be. Um, and resistance is, um, uh, is, is a tricky word. Um, people are, 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 are understandably hesitant to use things they don't understand. And uh, it's been uh, a challenge to communicate. Like this presentation is the result of years of trying to explain this with lots of hand waving. Um, and it, we didn't really have the vision articulated early on. And so it's been sort of an emergent activity. And we've had some early adopters uh, who I'm eternally grateful for those that were early adopters. Um, and then there are, then, then, I would say one of the things that I learned was um, we have to support this with policy. So my naive vision was it's so great. Once I show it to them, they'll just, you know, jump through hoops to use it on their own. Um, we've had to spend a lot of time trying to update our organizational policies and specifically our work instructions to, to refer to it directly. One of the big enabling uh, technologies that we brought online was a file folder replication system. So um, MediaWiki users are aware that MediaWiki uses a flat file uh, file structure. And that means that every file uploaded has to have a unique name. Um, and that is uh, that does not compute to people who only know how to use nested folders on their desktop or network file shares. So through a combination of, we used um, sub pages to replicate the nesting, and we created a specific type of um, article template and category and form or a class that page forms uh, enables. And we created a file folder class so that we could identify a page as a file folder. And then um, it would it would take on the appearance of, of a network file share. And then we used the uh, an extension called Simple Batch Upload um, that allows you to do in-page uploads. We stripped out all of the um, all of the things that ask questions about copyright because within the organization there is no um, there is no requirement for collecting. You know, if if it's an organizational record, you know, people aren't going to spend time filling out copyright information on, on internal organizational records. We stripped all that out. So we have these file folder pages where you can just dump files in from your uh, from your desktop 
and it prefixes them with um, with the uh, page ID, the 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 database page ID for the article, and then that guarantees that they are unique. Um, you can have multiple readme.txt files uploaded in different file folder pages. That was the big enabling technology. Um, asking people to go to let go of nested folders and switch to a um, flat file system is a bridge too far for most everyday knowledge workers. Um, and so implementing that file folder, nested file folder system with in, in page. Um, uploads was absolutely key in in getting users on board um, and I gave a complete talk on that at one of the EMW cons a few years ago that you could uh, you could look up and and watch that talk as well hope I didn't over her answer that's great and that was a good talk too I enjoyed that one um, there are three more questions so I'll just go through them in order um, the first one's rather long um, Thank you. Lots of stuff to digest. I love the quote you mentioned about finding the right information by the right people at the right time. The challenge about this often seems to me about how to integrate knowledge management into daily work without creating more workflows and platforms and thus making things harder to find. Any tips from your extensive experience would be great. Okay, that's a wonderful comment. So thanks for the, um, the compliment. And uh, as for the question, the advice would be to try to keep everything under one hood. Um, try to keep everything on one platform. That's why I say that uh, MediaWiki can do, let's go back to that um, to that chart um, that shows the MediaWiki as the constellation. This. So um, one could argue that you should go out and get a uh, customer relationship management software separate from your document management software, separate from your enterprise resource planning software, separate from your product management software, separate from your inventory software. And you get all these silos and then you have to build, you have to figure out how to integrate them all. But if you had one software platform like, like MediaWiki on steroids, um, you could you could implement all of the essential features of all the different software types um, and uh, and then so the part one of the of the recommendation is is to try to get everything under one on one platform and minimize different software technologies that the you know don't have the users go different places and then the other is to try to advocate for radical transparency within the organization so I'm not able to give you a live demo of our production system um, because it is um, controlled but unclassified information that would that I would be showing and um, but within the organization uh, once people have author access to the application we don't have silos we don't have further silos so th that's the twofold is is try to is try to consolidate all your um, business functions into one platform as much as possible uh, and try to advocate for radical transparency within the organization. Don't let team A hide their data from team B. We're all on the same team. Awesome. Um, three, three remaining questions quickly. Um, uh, how often do you update the media wiki and below stack? How do you validate that the new version doesn't break the business documents? And how often does this happen? OK. Um, the media wiki and below gets updated um, with a, we use Meza, as I mentioned earlier, Meza is an Ansible project that does all of the, um, the updating. So simple things like a uh, sudo yum uh, update to get all the packages up to date um, is all handled by Meza in a single command, uh, updating all the extensions, updating media wiki within the specific versions that we're calling out. So um, we just run sudo Meza deploy, um at the command line and sit back with a cup of coffee and watch all the software get updated um so we're the meza project is right now trying to make the transition from uh from centos 7 red hat 7 to rocky linux 8 or red hat 8 and that involves uh, a number of challenges uh, so the existing version of meza is still uh, still at CentOS 7, Red Hat 7, 
and it's still at MediaWiki um, 31x. So we are we're behind the curve in updating, um, but we're just in a few more weeks we're going to have our uh, 35x MediaWiki 35x long-term support uh, deployment running on uh, Red Hat 8, and so that's one of the uh, early goals for this year for the project. Um, as far as how often we update, uh, my counterparts over at the Johnson Space Flight Center Flight Operations Directorate, uh, they run a similar system for training astronauts and ma managing um, managing EVAs and managing all the inventory on the space station is all done through MediaWiki and they run a continuous update model. So they have a, a development machine that's continuously updating and uh, and then as long as the dev machine updates successfully, it authorizes the production machine to author uh, to update, and uh, and if the dev machine has a glitch, then you know it's on. Then then the process is on hold. So they're updating continuously. We're updating episodically, and um, and I hope that answers the question. Thank you. All right, we have two more questions, and in the interest of time, I'm going to combine them, and you can combine your answer. Um, is your wiki content all structured as in forms and templates or is there any encyclopedic content and do you see it most appropriate for these tooling packages to be extensions or to be bundles of pages with wiki text and page exchange etc um okay so i think there were two questions there together yeah okay and um please uh tease out the first question one more time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to combine them, but that was too much, pretty mm -hmm. too far. Is your wiki content all structured as in forms and template, or is there any encyclopedic content in your wikis? The, the parts that are um, supported by policy are all structured. Uh, however, we don't restrict users from developing encyclopedic-like pages. That's just when users elect to do that, they're doing they're using the wiki beyond what what it is um required for for work policies so if we have a policy for managing risk they will use um risk forms and and it will all be structured data um but if they want to uh create their own page to support that they are welcome to do it and many users do um but it is uh it's not required Great. And then the last question that was there was, do you see it most appropriate for the tooling packages to be extensions, or should they be bundles of pages that are provided using um, in Wikitext using extensions such as page exchange? Yeah, that's a distribution methodology question that I don't know the answer to. Um, uh, I can see it going both ways. Um, and at the end of the day, I, I, I yield to the smarter people in the room. Um, for my part, I simply want to say that there is a, a need for uh, a marketplace to exchange page bundles. And how they get managed, um, I'm going to look to the community to have the best uh, approach for. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, there are numerous messages in chat thanking you and um, thanking you for the great talk and I do also appreciate your coming and sharing this with us today so thank you very much and um, we appreciate it okay and thank you all very much um, looking forward to working with you for many years to come take care <laughs>